Good evening, welcome to This Week in Turkey. Federal prosecutors in New York announced on Wednesday the filing of a new indictment that charges Turkey's former economy minister with conspiring to evade United States sanctions against Iran. New York federal prosecutors charged the former Turkish economy minister Zafer Çalayan and the ex-head of the state-owned Halk Bank for participating in a broad conspiracy to violate the United States sanctions against Iran. The indictment marks the first time an ex-government member has been charged in an investigation that has strained ties between Washington and Ankara. The allegations stem from an ongoing investigation against Rıza Zarrab, a 33-year-old Iranian-Turkish gold trader, and Mehmet Hakan Atilla, the deputy chief executive of the state-owned Halk Bank, both of whom have been arrested over sanctions evasion. Prosecutors have charged the Mr. Zarrab and Mr. Atilla conspired to facilitate millions of dollars in transactions on behalf of Iran and other sanctioned entities through the use of front companies and false documentation. Earlier this year, President Erdogan had accused U.S. authorities for having ulterior motives in charging Rıza Zarrab, while media reports suggested that Zarrab's attorneys Rudolf Giuliani and Michael Mukasey were in search for a deal with President Trump and President Erdogan. Yet the new indictment on Wednesday expanded the scope of the investigation. According to the indictment, Mr. Chalian is accused of taking bribes from the proceeds of the gold trading scheme to provide services to the government of Iran and to conceal those services from US regulators. It is also noted that Mr. Chalian directed other members of the scheme to engage in certain types of deceptive transactions, approved the steps taken by other members to implement the scheme, and protected the scheme from competitors as well as from scrutiny. Along with Mr. Chalian, the new indictment also charged Suleyman Aslan, a former general manager of Halk Bank, Levent Balkan, another former bank executive, and Abdullah Hapani, an associate of Zarab. The final hearings into the case is scheduled to start on October 30th. Mr. Chalian is yet to make a statement regarding the charge. However, according to Reuters, the economy ministers Nihat Zeybekci defended Mr. Chalian, stating that Chalian did not do anything against Turkey's interests. It is of no concern to Turkey if Chalian acted against the interests of other countries. While President Recep Tayyip Erdogan stated that he considers the charge against Chalian as a political act against Turkey, adding, they are telling us that Chalayan violated the sanctions on Iran. Well, as Turkey, we never decided to implement the sanctions. The indictment came at a time that relations between Turkey and the United States had become tense. Last week, another federal indictment was announced charging three of President Erdogan's bodyguards over a brawl in Washington during his visit in May. Twelve other Turkish security officers were charged in the same case in June. Joining us from Washington, D.C. tonight is Aykan Erdemir, who is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and also a former member of the Turkish Parliament. Good evening, Mr. Erdemir. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. Thank you for hosting. So, Mr. Erdemir, uh, as we've just heard in the previous news clip, um, the involvement of former economy minister Zafer Çalayan in the Reza Zarab case, or what's popularly known in Turkey as the, the Reza Zarab case, marks a brand new turn in this probe. So, first of all, could you explain to us how this new, how this new turn in this case is being perceived in, in the United States? Uh, for those who are watching the Reza Zarab case unfold, uh, this was not surprising, uh, because uh, there has been earlier superseding indictments, and this was the fourth superseding indictment. Uh, right from the very start, uh, the expectation was uh, for the prosecution uh, to expand uh, the probe. Uh, this was a, a wide network uh, of uh, conspiring to evade sanctions. 
uh, to fraud banks, uh, and, uh, and and we knew that further institutions and individuals would be brought into the case. Uh, now, uh, on uh, October 31st, the, uh, the final hearings of the Reza Zarab case will begin. Uh, the only question in Washington, D.C. was whether before the case, the, the final hearings begin, uh, there could be a, a diplomatic solution uh, to the problem. And this was uh, triggered by the uh, the news about uh, Reza Zarab hiring uh, former Mayor uh, Giuliani and former Attorney General Mukasey uh, as part of his defense team. And in court, uh, the, the, the defense team said that their involvement, you know, Giuliani and Mukasey said that their involvement was to look for opportunities if a diplomatic solution uh, that would best serve uh, United States' uh, national interests. So there were rumors uh, in Washington, D.C. that Reza Zarab's defense team uh, was looking for ways to uh, settle the case out of court, that they were looking for some sort of diplomatic solution, and that diplomatic solution was interpreted by many uh, to be a swap deal uh, between Reza Zarab and the possible suspects of the case uh, and uh, potentially uh, with other individuals in Turkey. One name that's often been pronounced in Washington, D.C. is the imprisoned U.S. Pastor Andrew Brunson. Uh, there are analysts who believe that uh, the reason uh, U.S. Pastor Andrew Brunson has been facing uh, these dubious charges of you know, terrorism, espionage, overthrowing the government, uh, is, is to create a high-profile case that then uh, be used in a potential uh, deal. Mm -hmm. And let's now talk a bit about the reactions that came from, from the Turkish government and the presidency. As you may have also followed, the current economy minister, uh, Nihat Zeybekci, defended his predecessor, Zafar Çalayan, by saying, um, I quote, Çalayan did not do anything against Turkey's interests. It's no concern to Turkey if Çalayan acted against interests of other countries. So what do you make of these comments? Now, I think uh, these are unfortunate comments, and uh, the, the minister is not really uh, aware of the gravity, uh, not only of the charges against these suspects, uh, but also the potential uh, fallout uh, from this case. Uh, certainly, this case is not about Turkish national interest, and what's being tried here is not Turkey's national interest. But what's tried here is a, a conspiracy by a number of individuals, uh, you know, involving uh, Iranian Turkish dual nationals, involving Turkish bankers, and involving Turkish politicians. You know, a conspiracy to evade sanctions, uh, to conspiracy to uh, launder money, conspiracy to fraud banks. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, a major. A set of charges, not only against these individuals, but the consequences could also be grim for Turkey's economy. Just to, to remind uh, our audience tonight, for example, in a, a similar uh, kind of sanctions busting case, uh, BNP Paribas uh, in 2015 uh, had to agree on a settlement uh, for over $8 billion. And that case involved uh, evading sanctions concerning Sudan, Iran, and Cuba. And uh, the reaction from the, the, uh, the BNP Paribas authorities back then was that they accept fully uh, the charges and they would do uh, whatever is possible to remedy better kind of due diligence, better regulation uh, within the, the, the, the company. So I think the, the more prudent response uh, to, to these charges to protect and not only Turkey's global image as a finance hub, but also to protect uh, the public lender involved, which, is, which happens to be the second largest public lender in Turkey, uh, to, to, to have a more prudent approach to it. Because ultimately, uh, if uh, all these suspects uh, uh, are found guilty, and if then uh, this probe, similar to an earlier case with BNP Paribas, it's then extended uh, to Turkey's public lender, 
then uh, that could lead to uh, serious consequences. And when I say serious consequences, uh, it starts with a, a, a hefty fine, a, a large settlement, uh, also uh, being thrown off the, uh, the SWIFT system, uh, losing uh, all the, the U.S. corresponding banks. Uh, and, and furthermore, beyond the bank, this could also mean uh, Turkey being uh, once again put on various gray and black lists concerning uh, money laundering uh, and illicit finance. So I think that the minister's uh, initial response might serve him well uh, in domestic politics within Turkey, uh, but in the long run, I think it was not uh, a prudent move uh, to get so much getting Turkey and Turkish institutions involved with the sanctions bust case, because the fallout will certainly be beyond just the individuals involved. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you know, Zafar Çalayan himself hasn't responded yet to, to these allegations, but Nihat Zeybek too wasn't the only one uh, to, uh, to, to respond uh, to this new turn in the probe. Uh, as you know, President Erdogan as well uh, gave quite a defiant reaction uh, to this new turn in the case, and, and he said, I quote, they're telling us that Mr. Chalayan violated the sanctions on Iran. Well, as Turkey, we never decided to implement the sa sanctions. So what can you tell us about these remarks by, by Erdogan? Now, again, uh, I think for domestic audiences, um, th these are, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, useful comments. Uh, it will uh, create a rally around the flag effect, and it will allow President Erdogan to consolidate AKP support. Uh, but uh, beyond those domestic considerations, uh, again, I think those comments um, are made without any uh, awareness about the, the, uh, the, the gravity of the situation at hand here. Because the case, again, is not only about evading sanctions, conspiring to evade sanctions, but uh, beyond that, uh, there are a number of uh, U.S. banks uh, who have been, uh, through various uh, conspiracy, uh, involved in transactions with Iran, uh, which they're not allowed to do. There have been a, a, a number of uh, transactions that involve, again, the SWIFT system, that involve U.S. dollars. So uh, th there are a number of financial uh, crimes committed here. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter whether the individuals involved uh, think that they are part of the sanction or not, uh, whether they're Turkish nationals, whether they're Iranian nationals, it doesn't make a difference, uh, and they're culpable. So uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, Turkey's public sector, Halkbank, uh, could also be uh, impacted by the consequences of this case. Uh, certainly there are also political considerations beyond the, the financial considerations. Uh, you know, Turkish-American relations, uh, one could argue, is at an all-time low. Uh, when we take a look at what's taking place in Washington, D.C. over the course of the last couple of months, uh, it doesn't look at all bright. Uh, for example, recently there was a Senate bill blocking uh, arms sales to President Erdogan's security detail. Uh, which followed up on an earlier House bill, which again, in a similar manner, blocked uh, handgun sales to Erdogan's security detail. We also recently had uh, the charges brought against uh, 15 of Erdogan's security detail uh, who uh, attacked protesters in Washington, D.C., as well as two Turkish Americans and two Turkish Canadians. Uh, there were uh, a number of uh, letters and resolutions uh, in the Congress. There was one about the imprisoned U.S. pastor Andrew Brunson. There was another one ag about the uh, attack against the protesters. So it seems that on all fronts, uh, Turkish-American relations uh, are uh, going downhill. Uh, and uh, certainly these defiant uh, messages, these uh, provocative messages from Ar Ankara uh, are not helping the case especially that uh, now in the run-up to the uh, UN General Assembly, uh, th th there is still the question 
uh, about uh, you know which members of uh, his security team will President Erd uh, bring to New York? Will he be able to bring uh, his chief of security, who is now also part of the probe in Washington D.C.? Uh, and uh, we have to remember that in 2011 there was also at least two rounds of uh, scuffles between Erdogan's security detail and the UN security detail. So uh, all of these, I think, overall. Uh, makes the Zarab case uh, yet a another reason for concern. One, on the one hand, uh, for financial reasons, it's, it's a major threat uh, to Turkey's financial standing globally, as well as uh, the financial ecosystem within Turkey. But also, from a diplomatic and political point of view, uh, this could uh, uh, further uh, undermine Turkey's relations, not only with the United States, but with uh, also uh, its uh, other Western partners. Mm -hmm. You've already made some references to my next question in your pre previous response. As, as you know, Erdogan is scheduled to visit the United States uh, later this month, and, in, and this will happen in the wake of another indictment involving, as you've also mentioned, uh, another in indictment um, involving violent crimes committed by, by Erdogan's bodyguards. So how, in your opinion, is, is the Zarab case uh, going to affect Erdogan's visit to the United States? Now, now certainly uh, the Zarab case is like uh, the sword of Democles, uh, not only on Erdogan, but also uh, in his inner circle. Uh, you know, there have been four superseding indictments. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising if there is a fifth superseding indictment. It wouldn't be surprising if other individuals uh, from uh, the Turkish government or from uh, the Turkish public lenders uh, are involved in the case. And uh, we also need to take into consideration that, uh, you know, this could lead to confiscation of property, freezing of accounts and a number of other sanctions. Because in the earlier case, for example, uh, with the BNP Paribas, for example, uh, that uh, $8.9 billion settlement also involved a potential payout to all the victims uh, of the countries who have been sanctioned. So in, in, in the Hauptmann case, it is possible that uh, if there is a fine, uh, victims uh, of uh, Iran's act actions, uh, Iran's support for state terrorism, uh, could uh, make claims uh, from those funds. So, Overall, uh, on all fronts, things don't look right. And uh, to be frank, uh, Turkey is not doing a, a, a very successful public diplomacy these days. Uh, th th there have been a lot of uh, moves uh, which uh, continue to harm his image and standing uh, among NATO members. Uh, the, uh, the ongoing uh, imprisonment of U.S. Pastor Andrew Brunson on dubious charges, on trumped-up charges, uh, that might lead to up to four consecutive life sentences, certainly is not helping uh, Turkey's image. Uh, Turkey is increasingly perceived as being involved in hostage diplomacy, not only with the U.S. Pastor, but lately uh, with a number of uh, German nationals, including journalists. Uh, also with some uh, Dutch-Turkish dual nationals. So increasingly in Washington, Turkey is uh, kind of seen akin to uh, Tehran and Pyongyang's uh, hostage diplomacy. Uh, so I, I think one smart strategy at this point would be uh, for Turkey to return to rule of law, uh, to uh, release uh, various uh, foreign nationals who are held on uh, dubious charges and uh, also uh, make sure that uh, Turkish security details uh, do not further undermine Turkey's image uh, by entering into various uh, uh, scuffles with either protesters or security details at other institutions. So overall, I think Turkey uh, is suffering greatly uh, from an image problem uh, in, in Washington and also other European capitals. And the way forward uh, in terms of a kind of uh, improving Turkey's image and soft power is by uh, returning to 
kind of rule of law and also uh, returning to uh, transatlantic values mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, discourse. Mr. Ardemir, for my final question to you, let me make a reference to one of your previous responses in which you said, I quote, Turkish-US relations are now at an all-time low. So to wrap up, how vital do you think is, is the Zarab case for the future of um, US-Turkey relations? Now the case uh, has uh, a lot of potential to do further harm relationship, but we have to also realize that uh, US-Turkish relations uh, are uh, really uh, going through a rough time regardless of the Reza Zarab case. Uh, we have to uh, keep in mind that uh, the extradition uh, of the, the alleged mastermind of the coup, Fethullah Gülen, continues to be a major thorn between the United States and Turkey. Uh, also, uh, United States continued support for YPG in Syria continues to be, uh, again, a major concern. Turkish authorities. Uh, on the U.S. side, um, both, uh, you know, uh, with the State Department, with Pentagon, with White House and Congress, uh, as well as the public at large, uh, there are increasing concerns about uh, Turkey's uh, egregious violations of fundamental rights and freedoms, religious freedoms, minority rights, press freedoms. So, uh, regardless of what happens in the Reza Zarab case, uh, bilateral relations uh, will continue to be in turmoil. And furthermore, I think uh, the, the, the all-time law in bilateral relations will be further uh, compounded. The problem will be further compounded by what's happening on the European side, because we're seeing that uh, the German-Turkish relations are also uh, in tailspin. Uh, I, I'm just coming from another panel in Washington, D.C., where German-Turkish relations uh, were on the table. So Washington DC is watching very closely uh, how Germany and Turkey are moving apart. Uh, as you remember, Germany has recently moved some of its forces, military uh, forces from Turkey, a NATO country, uh, to Jordan, which is not a NATO member. Um, so um, the elections in Germany have uh, uh, further escalated the bilateral crisis. The France is increasingly uh, putting a, a kind of a more tough stand toward Turkey, especially because of the, the, the French nationals in Turkish prisons. And we, we are hearing similar reactions from other European states. So when we add all these together, I think what we are seeing is not only, you know, the Reza Zarab case undermining Turkish-US relations, but what we are seeing is a, a kind of a, a, a global problem of Turkey, drifting away from the transatlantic alliance and values, uh, Turkey increasingly being lumped together uh, with author authoritarian uh, one-man regimes, uh, and Turkey uh, rapidly losing its uh, soft power and also losing uh, a global standing and image uh, all around the world. Mr. Aydemir, thank you very much for your comments and for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. German Chancellor Angela Merkel and her rival Martin Schulz commented on Germany's relations with Turkey on a TV debate on Sunday prior to the country's upcoming general elections. Last Sunday, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and her arch-rival, leader of the Social Democratic Party Martin Schulz, commented on Turkish-German relations on a TV debate. Chancellor Angela Merkel said she would seek an end to Ankara's membership talks with the EU, marking a shift of her previous position. The fact is clear that Turkey should not become a member of the EU, Merkel said. I will speak to my colleagues to see if we can reach a joint position on this so that we can end these accession talks, she added. Martin Schulz also promised to end Turkey's accession process if elected as the prime minister in elections. He said, if I become German Chancellor, if the people of this country give me a mandate, then I will propose to the European Council that we end the membership talks with Turkey. Chancellor Merkel said also on Tuesday that she would discuss with EU counterparts whether to call off membership talks with Ankara, adding that Germany would also look at imposing economic restrictions on Turkey. Merkel had stressed that 
She will call on EU leaders to take action against the Turkish accession process at a meeting to be held in October. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan reacted sharply to the statements of the two German leaders. He has called on the European Union to explicitly say if it doesn't want Ankara as a full member, describing German politicians' anti-Turkish stances as an implementation of Nazism and fascism. We want EU bodies and European countries to be sincere and real in their policies on Turkey, Erdogan said at his party meeting on Wednesday. President Erdogan also said, It's clear that this kind of politics entirely focused on myself and Turkey will make no positive contribution to these European countries. But I ask this, how will these politicians be able to look me in the face? What has Erdogan done to you? Is this election being held in Turkey or in Germany? Mind your own business. Don't mess with us. Presidential spokesperson Ibrahim Kadın also said in a statement, the fact that Germany and Europe are attacking Turkey and Erdogan, disregarding their fundamental and urgent problems, is a reflection of Europe's narrowing horizon. After German Chancellor Angela Merkel vowed to call her European partners to either suspend or end Ankara's bid to join the European Union, the members of the Union present a divided picture on whether to continue full membership talks with Turkey. President Emmanuel Macron stated that ties with Turkey should continue despite the fact that the Turkish government has failed to meet EU's democratic and human rights norms of late. I want to avoid a split because Turkey is a vital partner in many crises that we all face, notably the immigration challenge and the terrorist threat, Macron added. Additionally, the EU term president Estonia's foreign minister Sven Mikser, who is currently hosting an informal EU ministerial meeting in Tallinn, stressed that no decision will be made this year on Turkey's talks. I don't expect the European Union to make any decisions in that regard during this year, Mixa said at a meeting of EU foreign ministers in Tallinn. The Turkish Coordination and Cooperation Agency has announced that Turkey will deliver 1,000 tons of humanitarian aid to the Rohingya Muslims amid the ongoing crisis in Myanmar. On Tuesday, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan spoke to Myanmar's leader Aung San Suu Kyi and had her word to allow Turkey to deliver 1,000 tons of humanitarian aid to the Rohingya Muslims. The Turkish Coordination and Cooperation Agency will be the first international agency to have access to Rohingya, the area of residence of the Muslim minority of Myanmar. On August 25th, Myanmar security forces launched an operation in the region to counter an attack organized by Rohingya's insurgency group. Following the operation, 120,000 people fled the region and sought refuge in Bangladesh. Myanmar security forces are accused of using disproportionate force against civilians. Since the beginning of the clashes, Turkey has expressed severe concerns about the situation which is growing more serious. President Erdogan spoke with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to push for rapid international action against human rights violations and called the international community to put pressure on the Myanmar government. Erdogan has also called several leaders of Muslim countries to organize joint action. Yesterday, President Erdogan's wife Emine Erdogan and Foreign Minister Mevlut Çavuşoğlu went to Bangladesh to meet with Bangladeshi officials, visit refugee camps and coordinate with the international aid agencies. Turkey had previously announced that it will provide Bangladeshi government financial assistance in its efforts to deal with the Rohingya refugees. A series of changes to the education curriculum have sparked controversy after it was revealed that the theory of evolution will no longer be taught in secondary education in Turkey. Turkey is discussing its new education curriculum, which will come into effect in September. The chains affect first, fifth and ninth grade students and the main controversy surrounds the exclusion of the theory of evolution from secondary education. Other controversial changes include the shortening of the time allocated to studying the life of Turkish secularist founder Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, an introduction to the concept of jihad and more classes on religion. On the other end, the failed coup attempt of July 2016 also features prominently in the proposed curriculum. The main opposition party, CHP, claims that 
President Erdogan and the governing AKP are trying to move the country away from its founding values and to make the society more Islamic and conservative. However, Education Minister Ismet Yilmaz told the BBC that they had excluded only unnecessary, archaic and repetitive subjects from the curriculum and that it was not fair to have a debate over a few issues when more than 100,000 changes had been made. Yilmaz denied that the evolution theory was being completely omitted from secondary education. We are not against evolution. If science says something, it is impossible to resist it. Also, the subjects on inheritance, mutation, modification and adaptation are still present in the curriculum. These are all within the theory of evolution, Yilmaz argued. We only say this. Let's not teach this subject at this level, but delay it to undergraduate study, he added. According to Orhan Yildirim, the chairman of Eğitim İş, one of the biggest teachers' union in Turkey, the most crucial chapter in the theory of evolution has been dropped. They want to teach about the origins of men as it is written in religious texts, as if we all descended from Adam and Eve. Orhan Yıldırım said and added, Ask anyone coming out of a mosque today what he understands by the word jihad. 99% would say that they see jihad as the main reason for war in the Middle East. We will not let the government put a spin on the word and normalize the concept of the jihad. While the education ministry says the curriculum was changed through consultation with more than 180,000 people who shared their comments on the draft, the opposition teachers' unions say they were not consulted and that the preparation of the draft curriculum was not transparent. Amid critics and protests against the change in the curriculum, the debate is going on. But in the end, many educators and teachers still argue that the changes to the curriculum are completely ideological. Prominent Turkish sociologist Sherif Mardin has passed away on Wednesday at the age of 90. Turkey's prominent sociologist and political scientist Sherif Mardin passed away on September 6th in Istanbul. Professor Mardin, age 90, was teaching in the sociology department at Şehir University until recently. We will always fondly remember Sherif Mardin, who has left behind an unparalleled legacy with his pioneering and groundbreaking scientific studies in the areas of religion and modernization, civil society, ideology, and center periphery relations in Turkey, said the university in a statement. Mardin was born in Istanbul in 1927 to a well-established Ottoman elite family. Mardin received his BA in political science at Stanford University and MA in international relations at Johns Hopkins University. He then returned to Stanford to get his PhD degree in political science in 1958. Mardin taught in prominent universities around the world, including Columbia, Oxford, Berkeley, as well as Turkish universities such as Boğaziçi and Sabancı. Throughout his career, Mardin has written extensively on Turkish political and social history. He was primarily known for his writings on the historical sociology and intellectual history of the Ottoman Empire, as well as his analysis of Turkey's modernization. The Turkish national basketball team will play against Spain on Sunday in the round of 16 in Eurobasket 2017. The Turkish national basketball team will play against Spain on September 10th in the round of 16 of Eurobasket 2017 after failing to beat Latvia. Turkey lost 89-79 to Latvia on the 7th of September in Istanbul's Ülker Arena, finishing Group D in the fourth spot. With the result, the host team will play defending champion Spain, which has now won 11 games straight, dating back to the group stage in Eurobasket 2015 with an 87-64 triumph against Hungary on the same night. Now we'll have a look at what's on in Istanbul this weekend.
Have you missed the festival spirit? Get ready! A festival weekend is waiting for you in Istanbul. Babylon Sound Garden is setting up a camping site this year on Kilios Beach. Their lineup includes the drums, Sevda Liza, Kadebosteni, Kalben and Wax Taylor. You can enjoy the true festival spirit with around the clock activities that will bring together music, technology and art. Salon takes up a new project in order to bring artists together with bigger crowds and to be able to host bands that require a bigger stage. In collaboration with Limits Off, the first stop of Gezgin Salon will be Beikos Kundura on Sunday, Kiasmos, Panto du Prince, Pional, Man with a Plan and Buber will be on the stage from 5pm until midnight. That's all from this week in Turkey. Thanks for tuning in and hope to see you again next Friday at 9 p.m. Goodbye.